Happy Easter to all of you listening at home. Uh, let's say Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Uh, and uh, I'm excited to be here with you uh, this morning, bringing God's word to you. Um, but before we do anything, I want to just spend some time praying again uh, for our nation, for the UK in general, uh, for uh, all those who are on the front line uh, serving uh, our country and putting themselves in dangerous positions uh, so they can do so. And um, we also want to pray for the churches all around the UK who are having online Easter services and trying to bring uh, the good news of the gospel to their community. So let's just pray. Uh, and then I'm going to read um, a few verses and uh, hopefully spend some time sharing with you uh, the hope of the Easter message uh, and Christ's death and glorious resurrection. Let's just... Uh, I want to thank you and praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that in love you sent him into the world. And in love and obedience to you, he came into the world. Thank you for his perfect life. Thank you for his perfect death. Uh, and thank you for his glorious resurrection three days later, which we celebrate particularly today. Thank you that in his resurrection that he conquered the grave. We thank you that in his resurrection that death has lost its sting. We thank you that through his resurrection, we are justified. Thank you that through his resurrection, we have new life. And we have eternal life to look forward to. Thank you so much for these amazing, amazing spiritual blessings that you've given us through Christ's death and resurrection. Help us today to celebrate that glorious good news. I pray, Lord, for all the churches across the UK, particularly our Twitter Schemes church plants, that as they share the glorious message of the gospel online today, that those who are listening, including ourselves, would be impacted once again by the gospel. We pray for those who are not Christians, that they would come to know uh, the salvation that they can have in Christ and the hope that they can have in him. And for those of us who are Christians, I pray, Lord, that we would remember that um, we do not have to fear. We don't have to fear because uh, our eternal state has been sorted for us already. We do not have to fear because Christ is on the throne, risen and ascended. We do not have to fear because death, again, has been beaten and conquered. I pray for the NHS staff, uh, for all those on the front lines at the moment. Again, I pray for protection. Pray for those who have lost their lives in recent weeks, uh, for their families who are grieving. Comfort them, I pray. Uh, and with the hope of the resurrection and the gospel, bring comfort to their souls in the midst of loss. Continue to pray, Lord, that you would protect our own, that you would keep us safe, um, and that you would help us to, to cling to Jesus in these times. In his name we pray. Amen. Let me just read uh, Luke 24 with us uh, before we come to God's word. It's just a reminder of uh, the resurrection account of Jesus Christ. Luke 24. Um, hopefully you've done some of the readings and sung some of the songs already in, in your own home through the service plan we sent out. Uh, but here is um, Luke 24 for us. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were confused about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men to the the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. 
And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to be an idle tale and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and taking in and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves and he went home marveling at what happened. Amen. Let's just pray once more. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you. It's living and active, sharp and a double-edged sword. I pray, Lord, that you would speak through it to us now. In Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, the news obviously has been filled with COVID-19 messages and news. And it's been a terrible disease that has hit our world and has hit the UK. Over 9,000 people are now confirmed to have died from the coronavirus in the UK alone. Uh, Conservative estimates um, think that that over 80,000 people uh, have contracted the disease. And more and more people are reporting sick every day. Even in the last 24 hours, uh, it's been confirmed another 1,000 people have contracted the disease. And who would have thought that uh, as we gather online for Easter that we'd be doing it in this way, that I would be preaching not to us as a church here at Nidri, but through a camera with just me and John in the room. For the last 12 years since I've been here, uh, we've been coming down early for our communion service uh, at 9.30. We've been having uh, a bacon butty, and then we've been having our usual Easter service at 11. Here we are, sat at home, hopefully safe, with our families. If this virus has taught us one thing, it's taught us this, not to take anything for granted. Who knows what waits for us tomorrow? Who knows what other viruses are going to come around the corner in our world? I think the scariest thing during this time has that it's helped us or it's forced us to look at the shortness of our own lives. It's taught us the brevity of life. And we've had to come to terms of our own mortality. Because most of the time, we push the questions of death and our own mortality to the side, don't we? We get on with our jobs. uh, We go do our shopping. We go on holiday maybe once or twice a year. We watch the football. We spend time with family. But the one thing we don't do very often is spend time thinking about death. And yet that's what we're forced to think about all the time at the moment. People driving themselves crazy watching the news reports. People won't admit it, but they're afraid. I'm sure many of us have been fearful and afraid and anxious in the last few weeks of our lives. Every cough we hear in the park or at the supermarket, or in the street, brings with it a sense of dread, doesn't it? Do I have it? Do I have COVID? I've got a fever. Is that me getting sick now? When push comes to shove, although we talk big, we're all scared of death. No one wants to die. We all want to squeeze as much life as we can into our short lives before we die. But here's the thing, we cannot escape death. It's right in our faces every day at the moment. On the news, we're finding out how many people are dying from COVID, how old they are, and how they died exactly. And it's plastered across every TV screen and internet site across the world. There's even a website 
dedicated to counting the number of deaths and cases every second of every day. This gets us asking a question, doesn't it? What happens when we die? Is this life really all there is? Is there life beyond the grave? Now and then, in our everyday lives, we drift into thinking about these things, particularly of funerals, of loved ones. We begin to think a little bit about death. But then, as soon as the thought of death comes up, we shut it down, don't we? The problem is that we've designed our lives in such a way that we force the big questions out of our minds. We spend all our time with gadgets in our ears. I mean, why think about death when at the weekends we can get drunk or, or take drugs? Why get into all that deep stuff when we can play Fortnite or a game of FIFA or go to the footy? Some people think that death is nothing more than a journey into another spiritual reality, nothing to worry about, nothing to fear. Some people think that once we're dead, we're dead, that's it. We're buried, that's the end, game over. Some tell us we come back to life as another life form. Others look for answers for those who, who've died and been resuscitated again. What was it like? Did you have any visions? Many people in a in this community, slag the church, they slag the gospel, they slag the Bible, and yet, when their loved ones die, when their loved ones die, they go down to mediums or seances to try and speak to their dead loved ones. The question is in all of this, who's right and who's wrong? They can't all be right, can they? So who can give us a trustworthy answer? Well, the Easter message reminds us this. There's only one person who can give us a trustworthy answer on life and on death. Imagine if a news flash popped up soon on your TV today and it told you that at three o'clock this afternoon, it wasn't going to be the Queen's speech, but it's going to be the world's leading authority on the coronavirus, going to make a special announcement on how our families could remain safe against the spread of the virus. If that announcement was going to be made at three o'clock this afternoon, we would be on it straight away. We want to hear from that expert because we want to keep our families and ourselves safe away from the virus. It would be a no-brainer. Well, Jesus is the world-leading expert not on the coronavirus, but on death. There's no one more qualified in history than him to speak on this subject. Think of the Bible like a, like a news feed. And it's telling us that Jesus has something to say to us all about death and how we can face it and how we can prepare for it too. And what makes Jesus such an expert? Why should we listen to him? Well, we know for a fact that Jesus died, that he was crucified, and that he died. We know for a fact that he was buried, that he lay in the tomb for three days. And we know for a fact that Jesus was resurrected bodily from the dead three days Later, We know for a fact that Jesus appeared to his disciples and over 500 witnesses, many of them who back in the day were skeptical, to say the least. In this church, we celebrate the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ every single week. It's just not, not just on the Easter, mess, uh, Easter weekend, but every weekend we celebrate it. But here in Nidri, most of us think that resurrection must have been made up. Well, much of the Bible, who cares anyway? Many people think Jesus' death and resurrection and all that churchy stuff has nothing to do with me and it's nothing relevant to my life. Easter's a nice story for children. Easter's a time when we bang down the chocolate all day long. Easter's a time when we, when we see family. Surely no one in our day believes 
that Jesus actually died and that he actually rose again. Haven't we outgrown all that stuff with modern technology? Aren't we much more intelligent than the cavemen that were around 2,000 years ago? Probably many of us have never given the resurrection of Jesus a couple of minutes thought in our lives. I mean, how does the resurrection help anyone at the moment? How does the resurrection help someone who's struggling on a ventilator with COVID-19? How does the resurrection help the single mum who's struggling at the moment because she can't work and she's looking after the kids and she's got to pay the lecky bill? How does the resurrection help the person who's struggling with chronic depression and anxiety and worry? How does it help us when the government has cancelled our, our payments and we've no money coming in? How is the resurrection supposed to help us when we're fearful, particularly at this time with the coronavirus? Here's the thing. Many of us don't care about the resurrection of Jesus Christ or we don't think it has any merit for our lives or any relevance to our lives because we've never sat down and thought about it for more than two minutes. Many people have bought the lie that the resurrection is just a story that was made up by done people 2,000 years ago. But here's the thing. Christians 2,000 years ago weren't stupid. They didn't just hang around on street corners making up wild and wacky stories about Jesus dying and rising again. First century Christians and people weren't stupid just because they didn't have FIFA or Fortnite or Facebook. People were skeptical 2,000 years ago just as much as we are today. The disciples were fearful and scared when Jesus died. Many doubted. You know, since the coronavirus has hit our country and the world, all sorts of conspiracy theories are going around, aren't they, on the internet and around our community. Some think the Illuminati are behind the coronavirus. Some think it's an airborne chemical weapon. Some people think it's got something to do with 5G masts. Other people think it's the government trying to kill off our population and kill off the weakest and the sick. Well, there were all sorts of crackpot people 2,000 years ago as well. When people first started, tell it, started telling others about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, people thought the Christians back then were weird as well. People weren't just scratching their butts, thinking this is all real, accepting it at face value, There weren't great parties going on when Jesus died and rose again. People thought the Christians were bang at it. People came up with their own conspiracy theories 2,000 years ago. And yet every single skeptic in history for 2,000 years has tried to find Jesus' body or work out how the early disciples switched to bodies and not one of them has succeeded. Not one skeptic can tell us why that stone was rolled away. Not one skeptic can tell us why these fearful disciples suddenly started telling others about Jesus' death and resurrection, despite the fact they faced suffering and actually death for their faith. No one can understand why from a small group of Christians 2,000 years ago was born a worldwide church. If it isn't real, then why are we here? In John's Gospel, we learn of a man called Lazarus who had died, and his sisters were beside themselves with grief. They were devastated. Their brother had died. And this is what Jesus says to these two ladies in John 11. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And he asks these ladies a question. Do you believe this? 
Now, these verses seem weird when we first read them. How can we have, how can we never die if we die? It doesn't make sense. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Whoever lives by believing me will never die. So which one is it? Will we die or not? Well, physically we all will. Of course we will. But Jesus here is talking about the life to come. Jesus is talking about eternal life. Jesus is not talking about physical death here. He's talking about spiritual things. We're all going to die. We're all going to face the grave. But here Jesus is saying that if we put our trust in his death and his resurrection, then the hope of the Easter message is that we will have eternal life to come. Elsewhere in the Bible, John writes this, and this is the testimony that God gave his eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. Hebrews 9, 27, another verse in the Bible says, the whole human race is destined to die once and then to face God's judgment. The amount of people running around at the moment trying to find food and bog roll about the shops, all trying to prepare for the worst to come if there's total lockdown. But the Bible says this virus is not the worst thing that can happen to us. In fact, death isn't even the worst thing that can happen to us. The worst thing that can happen to us, the Bible says, is that when we die, we all face the judgment seat of God. And if we do not have Christ, if we have not trusted in him, then we will face an eternal separation from God and receive the full punishment for our sins. You see, we will all face our creator. We will all have to give an account for our lives. But here's what we do. We live life without reference to God we live life without any thought of God in our lives. And we think that when we die, we're going to get away with it. But the Bible says that's not true. We will all face God's judgment. We're not in control of our lives. We don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next. Jesus is trying to warn us through the resurrection and through the Easter message that we need to get ready for the life to come. Jesus wants to warn us there's a price to pay for living life without him. Jesus wants to share with us a message that can get us right with God. Jesus wants to share with us a message that can get us ready for the life to come. Jesus wants to share with us the free gift of his glorious grace with us. For those of us who know what a courtroom looks like, it's quite simple. We stand before a judge, charges are read, and according to the nature of the crime and our criminal history, we get sentenced. And normally there are two doors, one to take us down to the cells and the waiting prison van, and the other door is the door to freedom. The judgment seat of God works a little bit like this when we die. We stand before God, and the charge is that we are sinners and rebels against him. We heard people talk about Jesus. We heard about the Bible. We heard about church and sin and all that kind of stuff, but we ignored it. We dismissed those Christians as idiots. When we face God... He will hand us over to the trapdoor and we will be heading to an eternity of separation. 
No more escape. No more pleading. No more bail. No time off for good behavior. Now imagine the judge were to offer you a last minute reprieve. Would you take it? What if he told you that you didn't have to be punished for your sin, for your crimes against God? In fact, he says, I will do your time for you. Not only that, I'll wipe your slate clean so it'll be as if you've never committed a sin in your life. All you have to do is take me at my word. Turn from your old way of living and follow Christ as your Lord. Would you take it? Would you take the gift? Or would you say, nah, I'll take my chances in hell because that's where my pals are. Only a stubborn fool would do that. Only an idiot would take that. Yet this is what Jesus has done for us on the cross. God has demanded a payment for our sins and in the death of Jesus on the cross, that debt was paid. He paid our penalty in full on the cross. He took the punishment that we deserved. He bore our sins on the cross. He became guilty so that if we trust in him, we are no longer guilty for our sins, but we are free of charge before God Almighty. But Jesus didn't stay there, did he? Did he? Jesus rose from the grave three days later to give us eternal life. Jesus is now sitting before the throne of God, interceding for those who might trust in him. The resurrection proves that Jesus is the real deal. The resurrection gives us hope this morning. Here's the thing. We don't have much hope unless we have Jesus. The world is so uncertain out there, isn't it? Yes, the doctors might find a cure for coronavirus, but here's the thing. We're all going to die. The question that Jesus is asking us is, are we ready for the life to come? Have you got the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Have we got the hope of eternal life? You see, the death and resurrection of Jesus is the hope for our nation. It's the hope for our communities. It's the hope for those who are dying right now. Jesus didn't come to make you miserable. Jesus didn't come to make you religious. Didn't come to tell you what to eat or what to drink or what to wear. He came to bring life. He came to bring light. He came to bring joy. He came to bring peace. He came to bring hope to our dark and lonely world. And that hope is offered to all of us this Easter. The hope of life in him. The hope of life eternal. Jesus says this in John 14 verse 19. Before long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. If we are standing with Jesus when the grim reaper knocks on our door, then we will have nothing to fear. Sickness and death only last a moment in the light of eternity. Believing in Jesus might not pay our bills or even save us physically from disease. But what it will do is give us peace now and life beyond the grave. What it will do is give us hope in the most difficult circumstances. What do we do when we get physically sick? When we get physically sick, we go to the doctors for our pills and meds and all sorts of stuff we get. We ring NHS Direct. And more often than not, they help us get well, or at least help manage whatever sickness we have. What do we do when we have spiritual sickness? What do we do to cure the darkness that many of us feel inside? Because there's no pill for that. Spiritual sickness is a problem that requires a deep cure. And the only place we can get a prescription for this is at the church. The church is like an A&E waiting room in many ways. 
Everybody around us is sick in one degree or, no, or to another. It's full of all sorts, rich and poor, working and unemployed. And yet, what unites the church together is that we are all spiritually sick, sinners who've cried out for mercy from Christ. That's what Nidri Church is here for. We exist to give the hope of the gospel to a lost and wounded and dying world. Let's end with this. God wants to heal you of your six, your sickness and your hurts and your sin. He wants to give you a new life, a new hope, a new world. He wants to give you new peace. But it doesn't come from making your life physically better, but through curing your spiritual sickness inside of sin. It doesn't make life easier. Life actually gets more difficult when you become a Christian. But what it gives you is hope and life eternal. This is not something you've thought about or looked into much. Then we would love to connect with you and talk through the gospel message with you. Don't just believe what everyone else has told you about the Bible. Don't believe the hype or what Wikipedia says. Read the Bible yourself. Read what Jesus has to say. And we pray that you might come to know Jesus as your personal saviour, as many have in this church. Let's just bow our heads and pray. Father God, we thank you once again for the hope of Easter. We thank you so much that through the Easter message, there is hope and life. Thank you for Jesus' death. Thank you for Jesus' resurrection. Thank you for the new life that we find in him. Help us to trust in him each and every day and to put our hope in him no matter how dark life gets. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I hope you have a good rest of the Sunday and Easter together uh, in your own homes. Um, and we are continuing to pray for you as a church, as elders. Um, and um, yeah, we just hope you have a good day together. Thanks for listening. Um, and I hope you enjoy listening to the last song.